Part five Propositions forty one to forty two of the Ethics by Spinoza. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Moylinger. The Ethics by Benedict Spinoza. Translated by R. A. J. M. Alves. Part five Propositions forty one to forty two. Proposition forty one even if we did not know that our mind is eternal we should still consider as of primary importance piety and religion and generally all things which in part four we show to be attributable to courage and high-mindedness proof the first and only foundation of virtue or the rule of right living is part four proposition twenty two corollary and proposition twenty four seeking one's own true interest now while we determined what reason prescribes as useful we took no account of the mind's eternity which has only become known to us in this fifth part although we were ignorant at that time that the mind is eternal we nevertheless stated that the qualities attributable to courage and high-mindedness are of primary importance therefore even if we were still ignorant of this doctrine we should yet put the aforesaid precepts of reason in the first place Quod era demonstrandum. Note. The general belief of the multitude seems to be different. Most people seem to believe that they are free, in so far as they may obey their lusts, and that they cede their rights, in so far as they are bound to live according to the commandments of the divine law. They therefore believe that piety, religion, and generally all things attributable to firmness of mind are burdens which after death they hope to lay aside and to receive the reward of their bondage that is for their piety and religion it is not only by this hope but also and chiefly by the fear of being horribly punished after death that they are induced to live according to the divine commandments so far as their feeble and infirm spirit will carry them if man had not this hope and this fear but believed that the mind perishes with the body and that no hope of prolonged life remains for the wretches who are broken down with the burden of piety they would return to their own inclinations controlling everything in accordance with their lusts and desiring to obey fortune rather than themselves such a course appears to me not less absurd than if a man because he does not believe that he can by wholesome food sustain his body for ever should wish to cram himself with poisons and deadly fare or if because he sees that the mind is not eternal or immortal he should prefer to be out of his mind altogether and to live without the use of reason these ideas are so absurd as to be scarcely worth refuting proposition forty two blessedness is not the reward of virtue but virtue itself neither do we rejoice therein because we control our lusts but contrariwise because we rejoice therein we are able to control our lusts proof blessedness consists in love towards god part five proposition thirty six and note which love springs from the third kind of knowledge part five proposition thirty two corollary therefore this love part three proposition three and fifty nine must be referred to the mind in so far as the latter is active therefore part four definition eight it is virtue itself this was our first point again in proportion as the mind rejoices more in this divine love or blessedness so does it the more understand part five proposition thirty two that is part five proposition three corollary so much the more power has it over the emotions and part five proposition thirty eight so much the less is it subject to those emotions which are evil therefore in proportion as the mind rejoices in this divine love or blessedness so has it the power of controlling lusts and since human power in controlling the emotions consists solely in the understanding it follows that no one rejoices in blessedness because he has controlled his lust but contrariwise his power of controlling his lust arises from this blessedness itself. Quod ero demonstrandum. Note. 
I have thus completed all I wish to set forth touching the mind's power over the emotions and the mind's freedom. Whence it appears, how potent is the wise man, and how much he surpasses the ignorant man, who is driven only by his lusts. For the ignorant man is not only distracted in various ways by external causes without ever gaining the true acquiescence of his spirit, but moreover lives, as it were unwitting of himself, and of God, and of things, and as soon as he ceases to suffer, ceases also to be. Whereas the wise man, in so far as he is regarded as such, is scarcely at all disturbed in spirit, but being conscious of himself, and of God, and of things, by a certain eternal necessity, never ceases to be, but always possesses true acquiescence of his spirit. If the way which I have pointed out as leading to this result seems exceedingly hard, it may nevertheless be discovered. Needs must it be hard, since it is so seldom found. How would it be possible, if salvation were ready to our hand, and could without great labor be found, that it should be by almost all men neglected? But all things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. End of part five. Propositions forty one to forty two. End of part five. End of the Ethics by Benedict Despinoza.